You know, today we're going to be picking up a sermon um, from a series that we've been preaching over the last few weeks called The Joyful Life. And if you've been here, we've, we've been in the letter of Philippians in the New Testament uh, for several weeks, really all the way through this summer, um, and talking about the possibility and the reality that we can have joy in our lives even when life would seem to state otherwise. Um, and that's, that's a really good truth, right? Because my life and your life doesn't always go as planned, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but every now and then my week kind of falls apart by Monday about 9 a.m. Anybody else, right? You, you know what I'm talking about. And sometimes, if you're not careful, we'll get into this cycle of thinking, well, the only way that I'm going to be happy, the only way that, way that I'm going to really have joy in my life is I'm going to change all my circumstances. I've got to make everything on the outside better, and then I could actually be happy. And, and it'll rob us sometimes years of our lives because we're chasing things in this world trying to make us joyful when God has shown us all along there's a way to joy and it has nothing to do with the outside it has everything to do with who you are on the inside and it has all to do with Christ and how you've let him work in your life and 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 so we've talked a lot about different aspects of joy as the apostle Paul speaks from prison in this particular letter to the church at Philippi and um And last week we talked a lot about joy and your confidence, the confidence of your salvation. Where do you stand with God? And and my prayer and my hope is that today, if you were here last week, or even if you had weren't, go back and listen and make sure that you can say like Paul, that I don't have confidence in the things that I've done. I can only have confidence and hope in what Christ has done. And my salvation doesn't hinge on me, praise the Lord, because I know me. It hinges on the work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary and three days later when he rose from the dead. That's where our hope lives in or comes from. And today we're kind of taking the second step of that particular passage uh, because we were in chapter 3, verses 1 through 11 last week. And we're going to be in verse 12 through 16 this week, kind of picking up that same train of thought because Paul knew that people uh, were working, trying to make themselves right with God, make themselves right with God. And so Paul is going to try to clear up for them the difference between being made right with God and living a righteous life. There is a difference, okay? Now, Now, a righteous life should follow a right relationship. But the right relationship is step one. And so if you're in the room, if you've never came to terms with your sinfulness and the fact that you need Jesus to save you from your sin and you need to confess him as your Savior and Lord, that's step one. If you haven't done that, you're not going to get anywhere if you don't have that step in place first. And so Paul addresses that first in chapter three. But then he transitions a little bit and he starts talking about the life he's living as a result of following Christ. And he's going to talk a lot about the fact that he's not perfect. He's not perfect. You know, um, I, I, read a, uh, I heard a sermon this week as I was getting ready for this, and a, and a pastor gave this illustration, so if it's not funny, um, I'll give you his name. Um, but he said this. He said, you know, there was a guy that went to a psychologist one day, and he said, you know, I'm afraid that I'm suffering from an inferiority complex. I, I just don't know. I just don't look at myself right. I'm just really worried about the way I view myself. And the psychologist said, well, that's serious. Let's, let's start testing. And so they start putting him through kind of the, 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 the I guess, a gamut of tests and questionnaires. And, and, and they, they send him home with homework and to, to fill out some things. And he comes back the next week and the psychologist goes, well, I got good news and bad news. I said, well, what's, what, what is it? I said, well, the good news is you don't suffer from an inferiority complex. He said, well, what's the bad news? Said, You're just inferior. And so, <laughs> so the reality is, though, today, is that some of us probably, when we live the Christian life, we, we found out pretty early in our journey that it's difficult. That to walk in the ways of the Lord, even as a believer, even once you're right with God and you're standing and you're righteous before Him, you still have a lot of working out of your salvation to do as you live the rest of your life. And, and if you've done it very long, you're going to find out very quickly that because you accept Christ doesn't mean that now you're perfect. You only make good decisions, right? More of my bad decisions in my life were made after I knew Christ than before, and that's because I was saved as a kid, right? So I've had a lot more practice. And I hope that my life is different because of Christ, no doubt. But I still would say that the Christian life is difficult. Keeping my tongue tamed is difficult sometimes. Treating my spouse well is difficult sometimes. Um, Handling my money with integrity and generosity is is difficult sometimes. To walk in the way of the Lord is challenging at times. And the problem is, is when we start realizing that we're uh, we're, we're not everything we wish to be. There's about three different ways we can go with it. Number one, a lot of people just kind of get sidelined. Well, I guess I'll just never be good enough. Because we live in a world where everybody's projecting their very best, right? 
Everybody's always done this, but nowadays, instead of it being at the coffee shop or at the country store, everybody's on Facebook or, or wherever presenting the best version of themselves. But I can tell you, as someone who's been in ministry a long time and as someone who's walked this earth a while, I've learned that everybody has a story and everybody has something they're not proud of. And everybody's life is not hunky-dory and perfect as if, you, as if it looks like online. We all have challenges. And what happens is that when we begin to look at people around us, we compare ourselves, and pretty soon we, we kind of just sideline ourselves from the things of God. And we become second-string believers where we believe that the real Christians are out there making ground and, and, and doing great things for the kingdom of God. But I guess we're just kind of second-best because, and we're second-rate because we struggle in some things. And that's one version, uh, one direction you can go when you realize that you're not perfect. When you have to start dealing with imperfect actions, some people go the opposite direction. They just say, well, I'm just, that's just a mere trip up. I just made an, it's an accident. You know, it's not really who I am. I just made a mistake. And the problem with that is we begin to excuse our sinfulness sometimes and our, our struggles as just mere accidents. But really, that's just driven by pride. A lot of times that's just driven by pride and not wanting to admit that we are still a work in progress. And lastly, I think a very common one you see in our generation, especially as Christians, is you see people that just go ahead and embrace them. And they say, that's just me being me, and I'm just being real, and here's my struggles. And we have this realness movement, if you will, and it's not all bad, but the realness movement some, sometimes falls short because it puts a premium on being real but discounts the call to be holy. And so people are real, but they're just real messed up. And there's not really any progress being made in their life because they've owned that they're struggling with this, and this is just who I am. The problem with that is God loves you as you are, but he don't want to leave you that way, right? And so this, this is fueled by ignorance, not by pride, not by shame. You see, sidelining is shame, excusing is pride, but sometimes the realness movement is just driven by ignorance of the things of God and what God has called us to be and to do in our lives. Well, today we're going to talk about joy in the context of finding joy in our imperfection. Finding joy in imperfections. The Apostle Paul, in chapter 3 here, um, has been talking about, all the way up to this point, about justification. Now, this is going to be a big theological word, right? Justification. To be justified before God is to be made right. When God sees you, he sees that you are in a right standing with him. And Jesus Christ accomplishes justification by paying the price for your sin and my sin on the cross of Calvary and us accepting that gift by faith. That's how we are made justified before a holy God. But, but after we are justified, and, and the Pastor Jeff talked about this a few weeks ago, we go through a process of sanctified. We've got to be sanctified. There is a process of our lives now being taken from the kingdom of darkness and lining up with the kingdom of light. And while we may be right before God, we still wrestle with the flesh, and we still live in a fallen and broken world. And we have to live in this world, and we still have to struggle with the things of this world. And so we need God's help as we are sanctified and made more like Jesus Christ in his image. And then at the end of that, and, and really that's what we're going to talk about today for these, last, for these next few verses, but at the end of chapter 3, Paul goes from talking about being sanctified in that process to talking about being glorified. That is when you are made perfect before a holy God. And that happens at the death of a saint. That happens at the death of a believer, right? Because we are raised and we walk in newness of life. When we baptize people, we are recognizing that we have been buried with him. We are dead to our old, or to our old self. And we are symbolically saying, but we believe in faith that Christ is raising us to newness of life. And we begin to walk out a shadow of that life now. But when we die and we are resurrected into heaven, we will be glorified and made perfect in that moment. Not just in our right standing before God, but in our actions as well. That's how this process works. And this is all part of the grace of God and how he works out in this salvation experience. And so we are made, is that rain? Oh, Lord, I'll tell you. Y'all want me to keep preaching now, don't you? I'll tell you, some of y'all need to get on your knees because you've been praying for this one, right? I'll tell you. Well, that's what we get. It slowed down. So. <laughs> Man, I've got all sorts of jokes that I can't say right now. Anyway, um, so Paul is talking to his audience, the Philippian people, about this process but he's also addressing another issue. There's an issue in this church and in the churches in that day and age 
where people were believing that they were already perfect in their actions. And so, and we don't know if it was a mix of Judaism and Christianity saying, well, if you want to be really perfect, I mean, then, then you, you, you've got to be circumcised and follow Christ. Then you can actually be perfect. And, and there's even some beliefs out there in churches today that would teach that once you're saved, you're perfect. Well, the reality is, is we're simply not. And you don't have to look around you to know that. If you're a believer, all you got to do is look in your own backyard to realize just because I'm saved doesn't mean I'm perfect in my actions. Amen? All right, so that's what Paul's kind of addressing. And so he picks it up here in verse 11 and kind of addresses this and in the process teaches what it looks like to have joy even in your imperfections. And look at what he says in verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this. What's he talking about the this? Well, if you look back at verse 11, he's talking about the resurrection from the dead. He says, I'm not already there. He says, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Jesus Christ has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those who, of us who are mature think this way, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. All right, four things I'm going to give you today from the text. We're going to pull from the text today. Number one is this. If you're going to have joy in your imperfection, the first thing you've got to do is understand that we haven't arrived yet, all right? Understand that we haven't arrived. Look at verse 12. Paul says this. He says, I have not, and it's not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect. Paul says, I get something. Even though I'm an apostle, even though my life may look like it's in order, even though everything may look good, I want you to know something. I have not arrived to perfection. There is work to be done in Paul's life, and Paul knows it. And that's important, okay, because I think a lot of times if we're not careful, once we're saved, we think, "Woo, good, now everything is done. I want to tell you, when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, that is when your journey is just beginning. That is when the work is just starting. That's when God brings you into his kingdom and now is going to make you a catalyst to do the work of the gospel message, uh, spreading that around the world. Your work has just begun when you accept Christ as your Savior. That is not the end game. That's the beginning point of your faith. And I want to tell you, the reason that's important is because in churches, a lot of times, we take such, make such a premium on getting people to come down in an aisle and pray a prayer or to get in the baptistry. And then after that, it's like we don't really do anything else with them. What a travesty. Because that is where the work really begins in the life of a believer. And if you don't understand that you haven't arrived, you're not going to understand that you have a great need to keep on pressing forward in the things of God. Now, now, here's the thing. is When you look at Paul, we're not looking at some rookie. We're looking at someone who's probably been in ministry at this point 20, 25 years. The Apostle Paul has planted churches all around the known world. By this point, the Apostle Paul has preached to tens of thousands of people by this point. At this time, Paul has already had a personal discipleship journey in Arabia with Jesus himself. If anybody could say, I kind of got it figured out, I think Paul's the guy that could do it. He he wrote much of the New Testament, but even Paul doing all of that and experiencing all those things says this, I'm not there yet. How many of us really get that? I'm not there yet. We look at our lives, and maybe we look at our lives in comparison to other people. We look at our lives in comparison to our friends. We look at our lives in comparison to other people on the, on the football field, if we're students or other dads, if we're dads. And, and pretty soon we start feeling really good about ourselves, and we stop making forward progress because we believe falsely that we've arrived. Let me tell you, on this side of eternity, none of us arrives. And that's what Paul wants to make sure people understand. Even Paul in Romans chapter 7, he says, you know, I don't want to do the things that I want to do, and the things I don't want to do, those I do. How many of y'all can identify with that? How many of y'all as Christians, you live your life and you look back at your day and you're like, man, I did things I didn't want to do, and I didn't do the very things I knew I needed to do. Y'all ever do that? I mean, if you ain't doing that, you're you're just lying to yourself, right? Because the reality is we all struggle with that. You know, right? I mean, that 9 o'clock morning, at 9.30 in the morning on Monday morning, right? We, we already blow the week because what happens? This week, I'm not going to get mad. I'm not going to get frustrated. 
I'm not going to tell my coworker this. I'm going to be kind. And man, but the problem is, the only way that's going to happen is if your coworker just don't show up, right? Because <laughs> if they show up and they're just themselves, we know what's coming, right? Because it's just great on you sometimes, right? And so, so what happens is we just blow it. We just blow it. I want, I want to tell you something, though. It's, it's, not, it's not good, and we can celebrate that, but it is healthy to recognize that, that I'm not there yet. I'm not there, because, because here's what it should do is, number one, we don't need to buy the lie that we'll be perfect in practice just because we're a Christian, because I think a lot of people come to Christ, and one of the things I try to encourage people as they come to Christ, I try to remind them, hey, look, tomorrow you're going to go out, and you're still going to have some of those same irritations that you've had before. Tomorrow you're going to go out, and your little sister's still going to make you mad. She's still going to annoy you, right? I mean, it, it, wouldn't it be amazing if when we came to Christ, everybody around us just became pleasant? I mean, wouldn't that be great? But they, they just they don't, right? So we're still going to have the same battles that we had the day before. And if we don't understand that, we will be dead in the water before we even start our journey of faith. Don't buy the lie that you're going to be perfectly practiced just because you're a Christian. Number two, be more gracious with others because we're all works in progress. You know, when you understand that we haven't arrived yet, it allows you to be a little more gracious with people around you. I'm great with me not having arrived. I'm not so great with you not having arrived. Can, can, you, can you feel me on that one, right? Like, I'm really good at giving myself some grace sometimes, but I'm not really good at giving others grace. Well, if we understand this truth that we haven't arrived, then it stands to reason that y'all haven't arrived, and I haven't arrived, and there's a place for grace and mercy instead of judgment and wrath so often. And number three, I already alluded to it, it be more gracious with yourself because you're one of those works in progress. There's some of us in this room that we're, we're dead in the water because we're struggling. And we falsely believe that because we struggle that somehow we are second rate. Because somehow we are not God's people. I want to tell you something. You need to get this in your head right now. You're going to struggle in this life. There's going to be tribulation. There's going to be trouble. There's going to be difficulty. There's going to be times that you wish you could just hit reset on the week. But there is going to be difficulty. Understand that you haven't arrived. I'm not giving you permission to enjoy the fact you're imperfect. I'm just giving you a rationale for understanding it so that you're more patient with yourself. So understand that you haven't arrived. Number two, if you're going to have joy in your imperfection, is number two is you have to revel in your relationship. We don't have a lot of time, but I want you to look at verse 12, the second part. He says, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. This is what Paul's saying. This is important, right? We don't work our way to God's favor. He's saying it's because of what Christ Jesus has already done in me that now I'll respond by chasing after him the rest of my life. Get, this is really important because there's a lot of misunderstanding here. There's a, the vast majority of people, when you walk out and you start understanding, hey, and you start asking for understanding of what it means to become a Christian, many people will say, well, it means doing this and doing that and, and being like this and being like that. This passage says it's about being in Christ Jesus. And because of the work that Christ Jesus does in you, that should spur you to press on following after him. That's the order, and Paul makes no bones about it. That is the, the, the order. There is something beautiful about us understanding our position in Christ that helps us when we struggle with our imperfections. I told the students at youth camp when we were in North Carolina, one of the nights that uh, we, we kind of had a debrief time with just our church, that yeah, I told them this, and, and I never really phrased it like that, but it's true. The two most pivotal moments of my spiritual journey, the first one was when I came to know Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I was justified and made right before holy God. That's by far number one, right? You know what number two is for me? It's when one day it occurred to me, the whole reason I needed grace in the first place is because I don't have it figured out. And I would, all my prayers up to that point in my life had been fueled by shame and frustration with my own, in, and my own insufficiencies and my own irritation and my own imperfections. And I would go to God just like someone just so ashamed of myself. And, and I'm not saying you shouldn't feel bad about your sin, but there was a moment for me where my load got so much lighter when I understood, wait a second, I didn't just need grace at salvation. I need grace every single day. And that's why God came too. It wasn't just for salvation. It was for this process of sanctification. And, and if you will begin to understand that one of the most pivotal things you can understand is that while you need grace at salvation, 
you're going to need it every single day as you work out that salvation and try to understand how you need to live your life. And that was a pivotal moment for me because I realized that I didn't have to come to the Father anymore as a whiny, shame-ridden, distant stranger. I could come to Him as a son who had access to a good, loving Father. If you're not able to come to God like that, then one of two things is happening. Either you're not His child or you have forgotten you're His child. But he tells us that we have access to him, that where we can cry out like Abba, that's like Dada. We we have intimate access to a holy, loving God. And we don't have to come as shame-ridden, distant strangers, but we get to come as children who go, Father, I I messed up, but I thank you so much that that's why Christ came to begin with. And I want to confess that, God, I want to turn. I want to do it differently. But God, I trust in your grace. And you walk out of this prayer time feeling so much forgiveness and mercy, which is probably how we should walk away from our time with our Father instead of shame and guilt-ridden. You see, if you're going to be able to have joy in your imperfected state, you're going to have to revel in your relationship with the Holy God, and you're going to have to really focus on building a relationship with God instead of a religion. You see, it's a whole different story. When you're chasing after a, a, a God who you don't really know, You just do the acts of service that he's told you to do, and you don't really have any intimate connection. But there's a whole different story when you approach a father. I mean, think about it like this. I mean, some of you, maybe this is not a great illustration, but I know for me it is. I mean, I can approach a father. I can approach my dad in a whole different way than I can approach my boss. I can approach him in a whole, because guess what? I already know that before I walk in the room, I'm accepted. Before I even get on my knees, he desires me to be there. Before I even utter the first word, I know he already has love for me. And when you begin to understand that that is the relationship that you share as a child of God, you can begin to even have joy even when you're not perfect. If you're waiting for for perfection to have joy, you're not going to be joyful this side of eternity. Number three, and this is where it's going to kind of get personal, right? Put the past where it belongs. Look at what he says. He said, there's one thing I do, considering that I'm not perfect, considering that i got work to do, considering that I'm not there. He says, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Paul says, I, I'm having to learn, and what I've learned in my life is to put the past behind me. Now, now, Paul has a lot of things in his past, right? He's not a young guy. There's some bad things in Paul's past. He persecuted Christians. He, he stood uh, approving the murder of Stephen, the first deacon of a church. Uh, he, he had hatred for the church before he came to Christ. He shamed people. He, he, he drove them out of their homes. He, he bankrupted people. Paul had a lot of negative things in his life that he could have got bogged down in and felt so unworthy that he never made any traction for God now. But he says, I have to forget about those things. I have to put the things in my past in the past. I can't live there. If you live in the past, you're not making any headway in the future. I'm telling you, there's some bad things that some of us have in our lives, some memories, some history, some things that we're really saddened by. And But the problem is, is when those things make it into our present and keep us from making progress today. Some of y'all did blow it in the past. So did I. But if we live in the past, we will live and wallow in our shame instead of move forward with the message of the gospel, which we've been called to. Paul says, I've got to forget about some of that. Now, you can't forget it. You can't act like it didn't happen. That's not what he's calling us to. He's not saying you mentally completely forget it. That's not possible. Because right now, if I said, hey, think about pink elephants, and then I said, hey, forget it, what are you thinking? Uh, How do I forget about it? You said pink elephants. That's all I can think about, right? Right. It's not possible. So Paul's talking about something else when he says, I, I forget it. He says, he, he, says, he says what he does is he, he puts it behind him mentally so that he can press forward with effectiveness in the kingdom of God now. He doesn't let his past mistakes drag him to a place where he doesn't celebrate the goodness of God today and can't recognize what's ahead tomorrow. He says, I put it behind me. So there's a lot of bad things, and some of us have some things in our past that we're not proud of, and and they've hindered us from serving God for decades. There's some of us in this room, I guarantee you right now, that you have a shameful thing in your life that that has been holding you back, and every time you've ever felt compelled to move forward with God, you have that nagging little voice of that thing in the past. And I'm telling you, Paul's saying, that cannot be if you're going to live the life God's called you to live. You're going to have to trust in the grace of God to take care of even the shameful things in your past. 
and you've got to put it in the path where it belongs. He says you've got to put some of these things behind you. But Paul also had good things. He had his achievements in ministry. He had his Damascus Road experience where he saw Christ face to face, right? I mean, his own story of all these miraculous interventions of God coming through. He had a lot of good things. He says, I put, I, I put things in the past. I, I, don't, I, I forget these things. He said, I, I forget what lies behind. Not just the bad, but the good. The, the, I, don't, I, don't, I don't rest on my laurels because of my past successes. Paul could just sit back and relax and enjoy the ride, and he would still have accomplished more than pretty much any other Christian in human history. But even Paul says, there's work to be done, so I can't live in the past. I've got to live presently and look ahead. Can I tell you something? This is probably more for a church than for individual people, but for a a church, which is a group of individuals, let me tell you, sometimes churches, we need this lesson. We We rest so much about the glory days that we forget that God is present today. And if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves paralyzed by fear of this terrifying world we live in, and we will think the answer is to move backwards, but the answer is to let Christ infiltrate the body today and spread the gospel in this generation. It's important. But if we revel in the past and we, we keep bringing up what has been and what should have been and what we liked back then, what we end up doing if we're not careful is we hinder the work of the gospel today. There was a, a story of, um, that I heard, and, and I didn't ask... Um, permission to share it and i meant to get clarity but i'm, I'm going to give you a basic version of it so, so i don't mess it up but um someone told me about a church they went to um one time and um said the, the church was having to meet about some major changes coming to their facility and and um i said you know in this particular meeting you know everybody's kind of giving their opinions what do we think what do we think here what do we think that and and um and said there was one older lady who was kind of a matriarch everybody listened to her right And we have those people at Round Prairie. We have people right now that when they stand up, you know, they've had history, right? They have, we we have evidence that they've been faithful here. And and so when they stand up, we we listen and we're like, hey, what what do they think, I wonder? And this lady was one of those people that everybody was kind of wanting to know what she thought and and said she she looked and she began to point around this auditorium that was going to be, I think it was going to be dismantled, but they were going to be moving somewhere new, something. And she began to, point and saying that you know that's where my children were saved and that's stood right there with my husband when this happened and I stood here and, and I stood there and points around this auditorium at all the memories it says if you pull up the carpet right over there we etched our initials right there in the concrete and the staff said well they were so deflated because obviously this is not going good for them if they want to expand the church right it's, it's, it's not going to be good And then she said this, but it's time for some new families to etch their name in the concrete. It's time for some families to have new memories of their place in this body of believers. And man, that one testimony of someone who said, you know what, the past was amazing. The past was beautiful. We we celebrate it. We love it. But it's time to move forward because that's the past. And so there's a powerful testimony when the people of God understand that sometimes the past needs to be put behind us. And you know what? We don't have to talk about 50 years ago. I've been around Prairie six years now. Guess what? You know how tempting it is when we start talking about ministry? As a staff, I told them we've got to stop saying things like, well, you know, before COVID this and before COVID that. And, and you know, we were here and we were there. I said, we got to start realizing that we're not there. We don't live there. We live in a post-COVID world. So we better figure out how to do ministry in this world. We don't need to look back. God has put us here today. What does it look like to serve him now? What does it look like it moving forward? It doesn't mean we can't learn from the past. It doesn't mean the past didn't have some good lessons, but we can't get bogged down there. What that tells us personally is there's no retirement plan in the Christian life anywhere in Scripture don't get bowed down in your failures or paralyzed by the way things used to be. If you're, if you're in here and you're one of our older members, guess what? Until you draw your last breath, God has work for you to do. I'm just telling you, there's just nowhere in Scripture, and I do understand the, the idea of handing ministry off, and I think it's beautiful when we can, we can hand things off generationally, but handing off doesn't mean that your hands are empty. It means you put something else in them. We are all called to serve the body of believers. Amen? From the youngest one that we baptized today to the oldest member of this church, we all have a role to participate in. And when we get bogged down in the past, well, you know, back when my wife and I, we used to do this and we used to do that, that is awesome. 
What are we doing today? What are, where are we serving God now? And I tell you, when people begin to get, catch hold of this, I think you'd be amazed at how the church will expand and revival can sweep through a place. I told y'all before about a guy named Gerald. Gerald was an older guy. I mean, like, I think he was in his 80s when I met Gerald. And I was in seminary, and we were at this little bitty church, and Gerald just loved serving God. Gerald loved serving God. And we did these evangelism groups that went out, and we invited people to church, shared the gospel around our little town. And Gerald said, that was Gerald's idea. He said, I want to do this. I think it would be great. And so I got paired up with Gerald, 27 and like 87. It was something like that, right? But you know what was amazing? That's the beautiful thing about the way the body of Christ works is because we were tight. And I learned so much from watching Gerald love people in the community. And a lot of what I can even utilize today in my own ministry is a result of spending time with people like Gerald. And Gerald began to visit, and I don't know, I just felt like I needed to be quiet because Gerald had it down. And I remember our church doubled in size within two weeks. It went from four to eight. No, I'm joking. It wasn't that small. But, it was, <laughs> but, but a lot of people came to church and came to Christ. Why? Because an 87-year-old man said, God's not done with me yet. And he realized to the time he drew his last breath that he's not arrived yet. If you don't put the past where it belongs, though, and that's behind you, then you'll never get there. And then lastly, you've got to strive to win the prize. Look at what he says. He says, one thing I do, I forget what is behind, and I strain forward to what lies ahead. The word strive there is an athletic picture, a term. It's, it's picturing runners who would strain trying to reach across the finish line before their competitor, right? It's the idea of extreme effort, just, just, just doing everything I can, you know, just a little faster, a little harder, a little more extreme, anything I can do to push my body ahead and get the advantage. He goes, that's how I live my life. Even though I'm imperfect, even though I haven't arrived yet, I live my life passionately pursuing the perfection of being like Christ that I'll never realize until I'm with Christ. But I still pursue it. I still look at my life and I contrast it to Christ. And whatever's missing, I pursue that with all that I possibly can. He's striving. He's, he's working hard. He's, and the word, the word press on, it's a military term describing a, a unit pressing to finish a battle. The idea is that there's this passion in the life of someone like Paul saying, even though I haven't arrived, or even though I'm not perfect, I still strive for being like Christ. Because that, that's the model, right? That's the model of perfection is to be like Christ. God says, he says, be holy as your, your heavenly father is holy. We understand that perfection is something we're called to, but it's not something we can attain on this side of heaven. But he says, but I'm going to work and press on and seek after being more like Christ every single day. And one day, one day, one day I will be transformed. If you look at verse 20, he says, our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Paul says, I'm going to strive, and I'm going to strive, and I'm going to strive. And one day, when I draw my last breath, my hope and my belief is that I will finally realize what I've been striving towards my entire life. How many of us does that describe the way we live our lives. We're going to have a quick time of invitation. I'm going to get the musicians to come up. And my, my question is this. As you read this, if you're like me, it's convicting. It's convicting because I realize there's some people that I should be more patient with because they're, they haven't arrived either. There's conviction there. There's conviction when I remember the fact that I didn't work for this salvation. How can I possibly think that I can work to keep this salvation? I'm secure in Christ. I am secure. And if you're a child of God, I want to tell you that. You are secure. Your hope is in the work of Jesus Christ. We're not talking about working so that you hold on to this thing. That's not what we're talking about. Paul says, it's because of him that I now do these things. It's because of Jesus Christ that I press on. It's because of what he's already done that I can put the past behind me. How many of y'all in this room, there's some things in your past you need to put at the, at the altar of God and say, God, I've, I've carried this so long. 
It's brought shame. It's brought fear. It's brought hesitancy to do things for your kingdom. But God, I believe that Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross is sufficient for even this shameful thing. Chris, you don't know what I've done. I don't have to know because I know the greatness of Jesus. You see, what what disqualifies us from salvation is not that we're so bad in a sense. It's because we don't accept the gift that's so good. You see, the grace and the mercy of God is big enough. There's a passage of Scripture that should make us all smile. It says, you know what? Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Well, Chris, I did this. There's grace that's bigger. Well, you don't know. I did that. The grace of God's bigger. I promise you, there's nowhere you can outrun the grace of God. Nowhere. There's not a sin you can name. Even if it's not your sin, the worst possible thing you can think of, the grace of God goes farther. Revel in that relationship. Put the past where it belongs. Trust God that he does forgive you. Confess it like he's commanded you to. Repent of it. Turn from it. But don't live there. And then commit your life to winning the prize. Strive like an athlete. How do you strive? Well, I'm going to tell you, this is this will be a whole other sermon. But some ways that you can begin to strive to know and to be more like Christ is to let His Word infiltrate your heart and your life and begin to act on what you learn in this Word. Now, that's a piece of this. God still has to give the growth, but there's a great passage that Peter tells us. He says, Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. He's not saying that if you read the right amount of passages, you say the right words in a prayer, that your life's going to be great and holy. He's saying this. You need to discipline yourself in the things of God so that you allow God to have fresh, open channels to pour out change and transformation in your life. Can God transform you without you reading the Word? Yes. But I've seen God transform most people through His Word going through the channel of his word and his truth. Going through times of prayer where we come to him just in prayer repetitively, day after day. God, I just want to meet with you today. I want to, I want to share where I'm, I'm struggling, God. I want to share where I'm hurting. I want, to, I want to confess some things to you, God. I want to, I want to worship you. Worship. I'm going to tell you, if you're not worshiping, you're probably not winning. You really, we must worship as a part of our daily lives as much as we possibly can, just coming before the throne, recognizing who God, who God is. And if you've ever experienced this, you know what I'm talking about. If you ever just had a really bad moment, day, whatever it is, and you've tried everything you can to get out of it, right? And I will wiggle out of a problem as much as I possibly can. I will think about all the things I'm going to say to that person to straighten this up, to straighten that out. And I just can't get this incredible weight of frustration and, 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 and anger or whatever it might be off. And I've got a road that I'll have to walk on. And if you ever see me out there and I look crazy, I'm probably just praying. Probably just had a bad day, you know, and I'm, I'm really having to worship today, you know, because I'm really struggling. And you worship your way out of that. You ever done that? God, you are so good. God, you are so able. When you start telling God the very things that he is because you've learned them through his word, your problems get a lot smaller because you start realizing the greatness of the God that you call Father. Worship. Another way that we need to strive is through connecting with other believers. Paul's going to tell the church at Philippi that they need to imitate the way in which he's been living his life. We need people around us that are striving so that we all strive together. That's the, that's the beauty of the body of Christ called the church is that we strive together. We just run better when we're running with people. Even though they're imperfect, we run better when we're running together. Get in the Word, pray, fellowship, connect with other believers, worship the Lord. And we could go on and on, but those are some key points to striving if you're going to strive for the prize. So I don't know how God's maybe spoken to you through this sermon. Maybe, maybe it's nothing. Maybe He has. I believe He has. I think there's some of us in this room, though, 
that we need to put some things in our past. We need to look to the future. And we need to serve God in the present. And if God has just laid upon you anything you need to pray about, you can use the altar. I'll pray with you here. Pray where you are, but don't leave this room without doing the business of sharing with God how your response should be with what he showed you today.